Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to E100. We get to continue in on this first fifth that we have been working on. It's been a, quite a good revelation for us to get to follow what God is doing with the patriarchs. And now we're getting to hit into uh, where we are with Joseph revealing. So let me get slides on everyone and we'll say a prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your stories of old, for all the creative ways that they speak your promises your promises of who you are and who we are because of you. We thank you for these figures of the past and all of their humanness that we may find ourselves in them and trust and know that you are a God who still calls us your people and who calls us to do your work as you work through us. Be with us in this time. Be with those who come and watch and listen later. May you give them, Lord, and all of us the gift of moving from our head to our heart that this word of God that you give us matters. It shapes who we are daily as we walk with you. Bless this time. Bless whatever conversation comes after and continue to bless us as we read the stories ahead. In your name we pray, amen. This is just a recap, everybody, of where we are again. And I'll try to, as I send out the email in just a little bit, I'll put the next section on there again as a reminder of where we'll be. And it's hard to believe we will be a fifth of the way through already of the E100 as we get to further from the story today of where God's people get to leave Egypt, what that means of the Exodus, and then going into the wilderness. And then as we get towards the end of March, we'll see what that is as God's people do get to the promised land 40 years later. And then as we get into April, we're going to get to hear about God's people in that promised land what that means of leaders and what it means that that promised land was occupied already and God was with them. So even if you've lost a little bit track on reading, have no fear. <clears throat> Jump in where you feel most comfortable. Uh, everything is online at YouTube and you can find it on our church's YouTube channel, Luther Memorial, uh, comma, Nebraska. So just join us there. Just a reminder, the movement of our Bible study, we're meeting these scriptures where they were intentionally written for, what it meant to the people of ancient Israel. And just a word, you'll hear it be interchanged between Israel and the Hebrew people. It's the same group of people. It just meant the source of the writer was a little different. Uh, as you remember in the beginning, we had the P source or the J source, the priestly source, if you remember that. Uh, they just use different ways to talk about God's people. Then we'll go on a slide of taking us for what does this mean as Christian readers with the Old Testament, with our Christ-colored glasses on. Spoiler alert, we'll get to play with what God says is, I am. And we know that Jesus, through the Gospel of John, will speak that I am. And then what does this story mean to me in this time of my life? And today I'll use this scripture for us, what we call Lectio Divina, but also some questions. And I invite you to journal with those after. And of course, we'll close with prayer. So we'll do one slide, everybody, because I left you on a cliffhanger last time. I think you knew where we were going, but we get to have Joseph reveal his identity. And as you remember in reading that story, it wasn't as just it's uh, the flip of a switch, everything's hunky-dory. It was a back and forth that kept happening. Remember, all the brothers brought their money, then they got the grain, and then the money was still in the bags when they got home. They came back and did it again. But it was a way that Joseph was using the brothers' uh, ability back and forth for him to be able to have pieces of the family revealed. And ultimately, it revealed that uh, indeed, 
everyone was still alive, the father was still alive as well too. So some common purpose threads that came through here. As you remember at the beginning of the Joseph story, he shared about his dream of where all the corn stalks bowed down to, or I think it was wheat stalks, bowed down to him in the center. Well, when the brothers are finally there and Joseph reveals the identity, the brothers bow down. So we start to get a thread in this story of what it means for these stories to fulfill the prophecy that was before. That'll be a thread we see in many, many scriptures. This is the second time we've seen this. It's the acceptance of the brothers without anger. Joseph knows at this point that God needed him to be there for that reason of carrying everybody through the seven years of plenty to the seven years of the famine. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. A remnant is a beautiful theme as well, too, we'll see later. But I want to focus on the acceptance. Remember when we had Jacob and Esau, Jacob uh, cheating Esau out of that birthright and blessing. And then later on, Jacob has to encounter Esau, so afraid sends all of these gifts ahead, but Esau, it's like, I don't need them. Now I get you. So there's this forgiveness, this acceptance that's coming out. And the third one here, the hero is an Israelite or a Jew, who, who is Joseph, in the service of a foreign king through whom God works. A beautiful thread that shows us that God's works and God's ways are not limited just to the Israelites or the chosen people of God, but God will work through anyone. And so, of course, we saw that through Pharaoh, through the, uh, the allegiance that he does as he knows God is in Joseph. And so we'll see that again later when we get to when God's people are exiled later when we get to Isaiah. And then, as I said last time, too, this is a bridge. It's an important story to carry us from all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then all of Jacob's son with Joseph, to the Exodus story. So that's what we have in the rest of Joseph as well. Just a reminder, as we read through the scriptures, big T truth versus the little T, the big T it may not be something we can reduce down to a fact or to history, but it tells us the big picture story of who God is. And our faith is what holds these truths. I've just put this myself as the little t. That's when, yeah, some things here in the Bible, we can absolutely go back and trace the little t. Hence, like in the Apostles' Creed, we say Pontius Pilate because we can trace back there was this historical character that was at the time of Jesus. But not all the Bible is meant to be read as reducing it down to a little t truth. Much of it comes in so many different genres. And the gift of that is just the way that the genres do in all of our stories, all of our reading that we do, they provoke in us responses that God looks for. Now, as I put forth these different genres, like I have myth and legend, don't equate those as we do today. There was a specific purpose of the past why it was used. Oftentimes we equate these with, it, it, it equals like made up or fairy tale. That's not what these genres mean in this time used for these ancient writings. These genres are just simply different ways of capturing God's people, the culture, the time. And that's what the Moses story is for. It's historical folklore. This is probably my favorite that we get in the Old Testament, because as you can see in this definition, it encapsulated so much. It's a body of expressive culture, including tales, music, dance, legends, oral history, proverbs, jokes popular beliefs, customs, material culture, so forth, so that we can get to know the culture even better of God's people. 
think about what it is just to read a history book. I'm not a nonfiction fan, but I know some people are. So I'm sorry if I limit that experience. But for me, reading history becomes a little bit more of a experience where I just find out about people, events, and I get it better, very matter of factly. But the historical folklore gives to me this incredibly col colored, uh, expansive way to get to see how God's people lived in their culture. So this, I sorry, I did not put the name of the person of the quote, but it's not mine, so I will um, call that. But if folklore is the study of traditional or un unofficial culture, then the folklore material in the Bible is the chief, if not the only means of discovering the outline and the character of that type of culture. A way to think about that is, think about how we retell stories about our life, our family. And when I think of, especially when someone dies and we retell the stories of their life, and it tells us all the funny pieces, it tells us the beautiful pieces, it gives us the color of that person's life. So in this way, this historical folklore, so that we can get this beautiful color of what God is carrying to us. This is just a simple outline, everyone. Uh, chapters 1 through 18 in the second book of the Bible, Exodus, most celebrated event. It is the Exodus out of Egypt on the way to the promised land. We're going to get to the revelation on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and the Book of the Covenant, how that is. God's people are apt, asked to respond in obedience. And then we won't be in here with the E100, but just a heads up, they are going to be traveling for 40 years in the wilderness. Hence, they need a mobile worship space. So there's a lot of direction about the tabernacle, that mobile portable worship space. And then, of course, many of us know the story of the golden calf. It is estimated guest, and that's about as good as it can get everyone, an estimated guest, that the Exodus happened somewhere around 1250 BC. All right, digging in a little bit deeper to the Moses story. Again, just like we did the purpose of the story of Joseph, I'm going to take all three stories that we have up here, the birth of Moses, the burning bush, and then uh, the 10 plagues and pull them all together. But when you talk or think afterwards, um, after the recording, uh, please do ask questions in specifics if you like. The first is the purpose is to remind God's people of what God will do despite fear of human beings. This we're gonna hit on with Pharaoh. Remember, we've got a really important pivot as it tells us that this new king of Egypt did not know the Hebrew people. And it felt, this Hebrew king felt as if that the Hebrew people were far outnumbering the Egyptians. So the natural response in that fear, kill the Hebrew boys. Then also what God will do, despite um, our human shortcomings, as we get to Moses later on, he's going to name that shortcoming right on. I am slow to speak. I do not have a good tongue, God. But God will still do despite. Another purpose is to show the resilience of the Hebrew Israelite people. I am a feminist as I read the Bible because I, and that just simply means I love to gravitate to the story of the women because it was such a time of patriarchal culture where men were the ones who were the leaders. But when we get to have the Bible lift up stories of women and the strength and resilience, oh, some of my favorite. And here's one of them. Remember when Pharaoh tells, as I just highlighted, to kill the Hebrew boys, it's the Hebrew midwives that outsmart Pharaoh. They use the stereotypes he has created of God's people of, oh, they're so strong, they can outnumber us. They go back to Pharaoh and say, oh my gosh, those women, Hebrew women are so strong that they deliver the babies before we're even there. 
So it is because of these midwives that God's people continue even in. So the resilience of those people. Also, this is used as I highlighted already to use an Israelite or a Hebrew for God's purposes in the power of a foreign king. Remember how Moses comes into the world as one of those baby boys. And for fear that he could be killed, he gets put in the river. He's discovered by Pharaoh's uh, daughter, the princess. And because the Hebrew uh, mom is hanging out in the reeds there, uh, she asks that, um, it doesn't know it, the mother to raise Moses while he is still nursing. And then he comes back and he's raised as an Egyptian. But he sees then the how an Egyptian is beating one of the Hebrew slaves and then kills him. And he's so afraid that then he runs. And I put it as he ran into life as an Israelite. He finds where he is going to be shepherding. He marries. Jethro is his father-in-law. And it is right there that his life then goes and joins with the Hebrew people who he originally is. But then God uses all of that to confront Pharaoh, the foreign king. This one, I hope this stirred you. This one is to demonstrate God's power over foreign power. So God's power, of course, is seen in those 10 plagues. And then you heard this mantra throughout the whole wholeness of the nine, first nine plagues, that Pharaoh actually was going, <clears throat> all right, I believe that um, we need to have you go sacrifice to your God. Um, I And towards the end, Pharaoh's going, I know I've sinned. And then we had this clear line, but... God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it was all to demonstrate God's power. So that's something I hope just stirs you because it's a hard question to wrestle with that we hold in tension while we're in these scriptures. But God demonstrates this power in order to continue with God's covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Two main themes. This is my favorite one of these two, and I hope you caught this. As I was reading through this last week, I kept writing down all the name or all the places God said, I will, I will do this, I will do this. This is the way that folklore is so beautiful because it carries us in excitement to what's happening in the scripture. It's what takes us from our head to our heart. Remember last time I shared with you that God had not a name yet. We hadn't had God reveal God's self in saying, this is my name. And so God's people actually used the familiar names that were some of the gods near them, but they equated it to this God of the Israelites, the Hebrew people. So that was El or El Roy or El Shaddai. But then we get this amazing, in the midst of the call story, revelation of Yahweh. I will come down. I will send you. I will be with you. I will bring you up out of the misery. I will perform my wonders. I will be your mouth. I will be with your mouth and Aaron's mouth. I will take you as my people and I will be with your God. So in some ways, like music, when you hear the crescendo of the music building, 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 and you know that something is coming. That's what this folklore does, is captivating you. And then he goes a little farther. God does, I am the God of your father, Abraham, the God of your father, Isaac, and the God of your father, Jacob. And then the peak of that crescendo, I am who I am. And that's God speaking in that burning bush. God is named God's self. I am is a word of being. It means being. God is, and God causes others and creation to be. I am who I am. So the revelation of God. And then, of course, the second and major theme put forth is this liberation from Egypt. God is a God who redeems. God is a God who delivers God's people. 
<clears throat> so we get this through the prophet and his commission. And this sets up for us another wonderful theme that we're going to be seeing again. The first calling of an Israelite prophet. And of course, in the Old Testament, we'll get Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jonah, amongst others as well, too. But we get to know that Moses is this prophet that God calls forth. A prophet is not one that predicts future. A prophet is one who speaks for God to God's people. And so we have Moses. Moses, we know his theme already. He's a lost soul, but yet God still meets Moses right where he's at. Moses doesn't have to do this and that in order to earn this. He is met where he is at. And in fact, it's pretty fun how Moses raises four objections that says, I can't do this, God. I don't speak well. I'm not going to be good for this. I wonder if that ever has sounded like any one of us if when we feel God moving us to do something. But it all underscores God's work of call. God's going to use who God chooses and God's going to make it work. Now Moses is like, who am I to do this? And he talks about his dual identity, that he knows he's this Israelite. And then he also knows that he's this Egyptian as he was raised that, that he's killed an Egyptian. Who am I? And then it's the response of God and the who are you to God? I am. And just a reminder of how the divine action works in the human action together. It's always in the past, present, and future. God saw, Moses saw, the Pharaoh's daughter saw. All of these past ways of seeing leads to God's response and God's action. And then the present. God is with God's people there in the slavery, and God will remain faithful to the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In adult ed Sunday school just this last week, we had one of our participants just say, it's amazing how all of these stories of the Bible make this huge picture teaching us about God, and they're all connected and pulling the same thread of God's promises. That's what's amazing when we see and trace a God who is faithful of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not isolated stories. Sometimes it feels like that when we've learned them in Sunday school. But this is why we study the Bible farther so we can see the big key truth of the big picture of God's story. And then future, I will be with you. So therefore, go and speak to Pharaoh. He doesn't take any of those four objections at all. So let's move of what this is as Christian readers from the Old Testament. These are just the reminders that we've gone through. These people are God. God is their God. The great I am that God says. God's actions work through humans. God utilizes God's power to show those purposes. Pharaoh's hardening of the heart. And as I gave a little bit of a spoiler alert, we are God's people. God is also our God through Jesus Christ. And we gravitate to the scripture in Romans 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We will always be God's people and nothing can separate. And not even our reluctance, not even our disobedience, not even the circumstances of the world not even death, because we are joined to Jesus Christ in a death like his and a resurrection. And then as I uh, preluded to, Jesus is God. This is why he makes so many of the Jewish people so angry, because when he says, I am, they know what that means. And so as we get to read it in the gospel, I am the bread of life. I am the light. I am the shepherd. I am the gate. And then Jesus is the lens through which we look at these plagues. Sometimes readers like to look at plagues like these and say, well, if God caused those, then God caused the towers to happen on 9-11. God caused the earthquake in Syria and Turkey because of. 
But on this side of the cross, we know with our sense making of God's ultimate expression in Jesus, that God does not cause the harm. Now we have to sit that sit with that tension, knowing that those plagues were used, knowing that God demonstrated the power to get God's people out of slavery. But now that we've had this ultimate expression through Jesus, we know God's ultimate <clears throat> expression is love. So we will always use Jesus as our lens and say, this God of love that we know on this side of the cross does not cause the earthquake, does not cause. But we do sit in tension <clears throat> and that's okay for us to be. So let's take a little bit of time, everyone, to do from the head to the heart. I'm gonna read to you the call story the commissioning story of Moses. And I just ask you to grab a word or a phrase that just pops out to you as I read it or bubbles up to the surface like you think about water. So I invite you to either read along with me if that's best or to close your eyes as hearing also pulls into you another way of being met by the scripture. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the God, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my title for all generations. And a question to leave you with, friends. If you said to God, just like Moses did, who am I that I should go? What would that mean to you? And after you ask that and you hear God say, I will be with you. What would that mean to you? I invite you after we sign off to journal or write a short response. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for these stories of old that reveal to us who you are and what you do, that you are the God of being, the being of you and the being of your creation, including all of us. We thank you for your faithfulness through the generations to us, move us from our heads to our hearts as we seek to know you better and to know ourselves better, that we may follow in the ways you call us forth like Moses, that we can be part of your redeeming, forgiving work in this world. In your name we pray, amen. Well, thanks for being with us, everybody, and God bless your time of studying, and we'll see you in two weeks.